Thank you so much for your time and attention. I really enjoyed being with you today, and I'd be glad to answer any questions in the time we have remaining, or you can talk to me afterwards either way. Um, yeah, so we're going to take a couple more questions here for your Q&A session, so um, brace yourselves here. <laughs> yeah, same format as yesterday. You can just come on down to the microphone here and uh, go ahead and ask a question. I think uh, obviously everyone appreciates that you're here, and most people would prefer to use the methods you're talking about. Um, when dealing with the health department, your advice was very, very good. However, you, you, your service or whatever would be better. How can an owner that wants to open a place or whatever that's dealing with a health, health commission or whatever in different states, cities, counties, use, like, you obviously, if you were in front of them, I, I can't imagine that they could say no. So I'm just kind of curious how your research and your knowledge can be used towards us being sure that we don't get denied and, if we're And where are you from? I'm from Chicago. Oh, from Chicago, okay. Um, well, uh, now Chicago, uh, probably probably a tough place because all the union requirements, right? You get in all kinds of it's things. It's brutal. It's brutal, I'll bet. Yeah, well, um, I can make my information available if you'd like, and I'd, I'd be glad to help you at some time, and I could give support to support to you. Sure. Yeah, let's come over here. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, one is about, it's a very odd question, but I think it's very necessary to know in a float tank. Um, somebody once brought up the question of urine in a float tank and how it reacts with hydrogen peroxide and it creates, um, I don't know if it's a carcinogen or what it, what it creates, but I'm curious if you have any awareness on this and, or if you know that that's absolutely not the case or if it, if it is the case. Um, do you have any knowledge on this? Well, no, I... I I, it'll be very effective. The UV peroxide process will break down the urine. I mean, in spas, with the higher temperature at 104 degrees, you actually have more chance for um, urination uh, potential in there, and, and it controlled that fine. It'll break it down. So you think it, it breaks it down, but it doesn't create anything new or release anything? It's one of the organics that, that, that show up in those COD tests, yes. Cool. Yeah, so it'll break it down. Now, I'm going to qualify that by, again, I don't know situation in float tanks specifically because I never did experimentation and data. So, so what's going to also involve too is you've got a different recirculation type system and, and you're operating a little bit different uh, perspectives than with spas. So we can't, like I was saying throughout the talk, can't just assume that it directly applies. You know, you'd want to you'd test for it and then try different, different things and find out. Thank you. And if I can? Um, Combining UV and hydrogen peroxide, um, I'm curious how you got to that point and what you think about, I mean, based on your presentation, it sounds like why not have UV? It seems like a very, I mean, once it's installed, it's very simple and it's just a great backup to have. I'm curious what kind of testing, um, if, if any, occurred without UV being involved, simply hydrogen peroxide, and what kind of results you got? Like how, how extremely, or um, how much synergy happens when combining the two? Okay. Um. Well, I guess maybe the short answer to that is that um, we never tried just peroxide alone because peroxide is not a disinfectant, and you cannot make that claim. I mean, legally, you cannot make that claim. Um, it's not registered as a pesticide. Remember I mentioned the US EPA side? Chemicals would have to go through the registration process and be approved as a disinfectant, and no peroxide manufacturer has attempted to do that. And then when you look at the studies, peroxide does have an antiseptic effect. Uh, as you know, your home, your home peroxide and everything. And it will um, selectively, like um, on staff, it's fairly, fairly good. And peroxide's fairly good on staff. But on a lot of other microorganisms, it's not. So it can't be declared that way. So we just um, used it with the UV peroxide process. And was there another part of that? that no, that was great. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for that information. Um, is, and just to clarify back on the first question, is any of that uh, data published and available online or in any journals and stuff like that? Is it out there for us to get? Um, yeah, somebody asked me that before, the, uh, before I even talked. And, um, unfortunately, my work was all done in the 80s before the internet became available. And so mu published? much of that stuff was not, is not available there. Um, I, have, I have it available in hard copies. That I've kept as files and everything like that, but um, but no, it's not available. Part anymore. of our health authority problems are uh, getting data that's uh, been 
peer reviewed and, and published properly in journals and things like that. Was that was that information published ever formally anywhere? Yes, at um, well, the Oregon spot test I talked about there, that was in the Journal of Environmental Health, which is sort of the Bible for the, all the health officials throughout the country. Okay. And uh, that was peer reviewed by them, went through them, and, right. and then they also asked me to speak at their annual conference, which I did. And so that carried a lot of credibility throughout the public health community. Do you have uh, experience working with this system in float tanks, personally? No. No, I've um, done some preliminary work with Jim Hefner of Just Float, um, but um, he's a starting up, and so we haven't gone into in the great depth about it now. Are there any issues with the bubbles uh, in hydrogen peroxide clinging to the glass of the UV and diffracting the light in any way or anything like that? Absolutely not. And no. maybe this is more to people that are using the system right now with their float tanks. Um, is there any concentrated like parts, parts per million level that you're experiencing where you're getting that bubbling sensation on the skin like you're floating in soda? Is anyone experiencing that? You are? Okay, like we've experienced that like with our, just our testing on our personal tank that we're getting like a bubbling feeling on the body. And it's very distracting for the tactile sensation, so uh, maybe anyone experienced that we can talk about outside. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Well, if, you if you want to, afterwards, you want to get together, you can give me your contact information. I can get you some data. Awesome, there. thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, I have a question. Uh, with sort of with UV hydrogen peroxide, with the bulk of the sanitation sort of happening outside of the tank and sort of the small volume of water, do you think there would be any issue with re-inoculation of the water from contaminants maybe on the side of the tank at all? Um, well, again, that may be something, something to, to take a look at. Um, you're going to get, um, you always have the risk of potentially having some dead water that doesn't get treated. And I would think, as part of your maintenance procedure, though, uh, at some point, whether it be the end of the day or end of the week, I don't know what it might be, you'd certainly want to be cleaning the sides, at least, in addition to whatever you're doing. And unless you have such an efficient recirculation system, I'd have to see, it would depend on the design. Is it you know, going to be square, rectangular, round? What kind of inlet and outlet types of things? Because that, that's the same issue you have in pools and spas and with chlorine. Um, my home pool... And I use chlorine, well, I'm not out to knock chlorine, but I have two people, my wife and I use the pool, and the potential for problems is zero. And it's plumb to take UV, but it's not worth spending money on UV peroxide for the little that we use it. But um, I'll use chlorine in my water, and I, my, I can just look at the water, and I can handle my water, and it's beautiful all the time. But even still, you've got a potential, and we don't use it for a while, to get an algae growth along the walls, because there's no movement in some areas. So the chlorine's not going to even get to it. So it can happen under any process. You have to you have to take that into account in your overall design and engineering. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, thanks. Okay. I heard there's some question if UV can penetrate Epsom salt solution. Um, can you speak to that at all? Yes. Um, uh, suspected it did, but that was one of the things that Jim Hefner has done a test on. And Jim, you want to tell him what the transmission results were? 94% penetration is uh, what he just said. All right, let's take a last question over here. Uh, I know you mentioned something that a uh, broadside manufacturing company might not be might not be in their interest to um, uh, have it uh, certified or uh, recognized as a disinfectant. Um, I was wondering about maybe the uh, uh, the uh, legality or maybe the uh, possibility of a third party manufacturer or third party bottling and distribution company. Um, going through the process of having to recognize the disinfectant, and, uh, what would that say? Well, I mean, there's nothing potentially stopping them from doing so. But again, they would have to go to the US EPA. Um, disinfectants are re registered under FIFRA, Federal Insecticide, Roadside, Pesticide um, Act, which um, gives EPA sole authority over designation of um, whether something is a disinfectant or not. And this applies to all chemicals that are used um, and claims to be disinfected. And then they have to go through a series of tests. They're very expensive, and it takes many, many years to get that approval. Um, so I don't think manufacturers would be that interested in doing it. And, and whereas what we showed there is that the UV unit, it's a physical means of disinfection, does not require that registration. But you can't have false labeling. You can't make claims. You can't say, oh, it will 
disinfect something and it won't. It still has to do the job, but it doesn't have to be registered. It doesn't have to go through the testing process. Thank you, Bob. Rich, the last question here. Thank you, Bob. Fabulous presentation, and thank you for bringing back the information thank and the you. knowledge that you shared with the industry so many years ago and mentioning a way that we can reaccess that data and use it today. You know, if it was published in 86 or 88 in the you know, Environmental Health Association's journal, I guess someone could just walk down the road to the, uh, to the library on campus here and get an old copy of that or maybe on microfiche. Yeah, if they do have, right, right. If they do have yeah. copies, old copies um, of the Journal of Environmental Health, it would be there. You know, to, to some of the points you made about the uh, chemical nature, yeah, if someone uses a chemical and they want to call it a disinfectant, you have to have EPA registration. As you indicated, expensive, time-consuming process, but not necessary if you have a system. That's really what you're talking about. You're using hydrogen peroxide to kind of amp up the ability of the UV system. So with that, it's more of the treatment process. And yes, it's going to be very dependent on the power of that UV system, the UV transmissivity of the water. That's the critical issue. That's kind of taking all the water chemistry, cloudiness, turbidity, all those issues. Really, the UVT of the water is that kind of critical way of measuring the ability of the, the light to transmit through and cause its effect, either on the organism or breaking down those organics into hopefully simpler compounds. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, thank you for sharing that data with the group because that's probably a technology that really had been used in the past, has been used in this sort of uh, process, but hasn't been mainstream recently in pool and spa treatment. It just, it doesn't seem to have gotten a lot of traction lately. It's almost like other interests pushed in and pushed that to the side. But we know that it's difficult to get chlorine residuals in the water, but maybe with hydrogen peroxide it's easier to uh, test for and maintain and, and easily test that in the float tank industry and then using the UV system to really help uh, increase the oxidation performance. It seems like it could be a really good solution for this industry. So I, again, fully encourage the industry to try to pursue this avenue. Uh, and and uh, to underscore, thank you very much. And, and to underscore your point, um, when I had to deal with the state of California, in California, the state doesn't approve any particular process itself. It's got its code, but each individual county has to go through the approval process. The counties, no county wanted to step out and stick their neck on the line, so they turned to the state and they said, tell us what to do. And so the state contacted me, and worked it out, gave, I gave them all kinds of data, everything that line. Um, they did their own research and they came back, and what their opinion was, in a sense, was they said that, um, it's a UV, process, UV peroxide process as a whole, because they require a residual, chemical residual in the water, which peroxide is. It doesn't say halogen chemical residual. It says chemical residual and disinfection. But the process as a whole produced disinfection results that are um, possible. And then this allowed the counties to individually approve it because the state had given them that, that different opinion. But, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a great process. Um, somebody here told me... Um, that the county of Orange County is using UV peroxide and reverse osmosis to treat wastewater and turn it into drinking water. And if that isn't a testimony to um, what the process can do, uh, nothing is. And, and these spas, I, I didn't put up here, but I've got data showing that in these spas, the water quality was equivalent to sewerage in a lot of these spas. And we were treating it, and we would run spas for years without changing the water. Uh, and absolutely just powerful, powerful water treatment. We used it in, in toxic and hazardous waste. I started doing some work in that and kind of went full circle and effectively cleaned up groundwater from many chemicals. Anyway, I've run way over time. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Another round of applause for Bob Cameron.